My first podcast interview today will be with Ashley Clark Huffman. Ashley is known on TikTok to be the woman who prostituted for 20 years. Ashley's a large creator on TikTok. I've found her. Um, she came up on my For You page and I was so excited to hear about her story of her abuse. You look beautiful. Oh, thank you. Well, you look good. You have a nice little studio. And everything. I like it. You have inspired me to be here. Like you, of all people. Like I can't even thank you. <laughs> I could almost cry sitting here. Like talking to you is just a dream come true to me. So I can um, see that you are willing to do this for me. Thank you so much um, for being yeah. here. So I introduced everybody to you a little bit. Uh, um, sh sharing your story a little bit on TikTok, you share that, you know, you've been uh, in the prostitution world for 20 years. And what I was really interested on is how your life led you to prostitution and how, how the, the abuse as a child, I'm sure had a huge impact on, on what happened to you in your life. So I kind of wanted you to start from the beginning, if you can, on what happened and, you know, so like long story short, well, I guess there's really no long story short with mine, but, um, you know, I was raised by my grandparents. My mom passed away when I was literally like a year old and my dad, like my biological dad, he's still alive, but I'm 35. I've only seen him four times. So I, I say that he's passed away along with my mom. Um, so I was raised by my grandparents and, um, you know, I had made, I made a statement the other day or the other week, like, oh, you know, if my life was just my grandparents alone without my brothers, without my other family, like it would have been great. But then like, I went on to say, you know, how like, you know, the disciplinary things were like, you know, my grandpa would literally chase me with a belt and beat me with a belt and all this stuff. But I thought like, that was normal. Like back in the day, you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like how you discipline kids back in the day and versus now is different. So I thought it was normal, but, um, you know, my life with my grandparents was, I thought it was, you know, good. Um, until, you know, we had moved, I think like the earliest memory I have of anything going wrong was when we moved, we lived in California and, I think I was like maybe five, five or six. And we were in the garage, me and my two older brothers. And I remember um, one of my brothers had left the garage and shut the garage door. And then my other, my oldest brother, he ended up pulling his pants down and um, made me, you know, touch him and do other things to him and stuff. And I remember him saying, you know, cause I suck my thumb. I still suck my thumb even till this day. I know. But, um, I remember him telling me, you know, just act like, you know, you're sucking your thumb. That's what exactly what he said to me. And I remember, you know, running into the house, just screaming. And I went, you know, straight to my grandma's room and she was like, Whoa, what's going on? And I told her and that, she didn't even do anything from my, from my, you know, from what I remember, nothing was done. And I believe that weekend, um, like my grandparents used to go to Mexico all the time. I'm not Tijuana all the time. I'm not too sure why, but they went like every other weekend. But, um, so, you know, even that weekend they went to Tijuana and they left me with my brothers. So there's a lot of things that happened in my childhood that I don't remember, but bits and pieces throughout the years I've been, you know, dreaming about, I've been having flashbacks, even like I would be talking to somebody and I would just have like a random flashback of something. And I'm like, Whoa, is that true or not true? Well, when I was about seven, we moved back to Ohio and, um, like, I didn't even know my grandparents was my grandparents until I was like seven, seven or eight years old. And my aunt had came over and she was like, stop calling my, you know, my mom and dad, mom and dad, they're not your mom and dad, they're your grandparents. And I'm like, what? And so she was like, your mom died when he was baby. Your dad doesn't want anything to do with you. They're your grandparents. So I remember 
going in, I was upset. And my grandma, that's when she told me, you know, the truth, like, you know, we're not your, you know, parents, this is what happened and all this stuff. So, you know, my relationship with my family, besides like my grandparents, like, it seems like every single member of that family was, they were, they just didn't like me. They just, I, I don't know what it was. I don't know if maybe, uh, you know, cause my mom passed away and I was her only daughter Then maybe they felt like I was trying to replace her. I, I don't know what the hell was going on, but we didn't spend so much tr- time trying to figure out what we did wrong. Yeah. You know, and I, I hear you because like, I'm being attacked at every angle from my family for doing this, what I'm doing here today. And like, I think I hear you and I hear myself in you when you say, um, you know, your family, you know, you don't know what you did wrong. Shit. We did nothing wrong. Like we were children and, 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 and like, it's heartbreaking to think that, you know, I, I've said that exact same word that you just said. So, I, I mean, I hear you and it's interesting to hear that us talk and still blame ourselves. And, um, you know, you were only seven years old, you just told me. So, I mean, you have a seven-year-old and I can't imagine you thinking that about them, you know, what did they do wrong? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. It was, it was, you know, they, you know, I, I never had a a good relationship with any one of my family members. You know, I think like the closest family member that I was, you know, close to was my grandpa. And I remember like my grandma, you know, she would ask me every now and then, Hey, uh, because I used to go on road trips with him. He was a truck driver and he would go, we lived in Ohio, but he go to California, to Texas, like all over. And she would pull me out of school to go with him. Um, and I remember her, you know, she asking me numerous times, um, you know, did, did dad ever do anything to you? Did he, did he ever touch you and all that stuff? And I'm like, no, like I, I used to get so mad at her for asking me that. And so, you know, I didn't really think anything of it. And then, um, I remember, uh, you know, I think like the last time she asked me, like, I just went off on her. I was like, man, stop asking me this. And she's like, well, I'm asking you because, um, I ended up catching him, you know, he was drunk one night and he ended up going into, you know, your mom's room when she was really little and he was touching her. So she caught him, you know, doing that. Um, and she's like, I just want to make sure that he's not doing that to you. I'm like, no, he's never done that to me. And even to this day, like, I'm not sure if, he has or hasn't just because I know like ever since she said that, like, you know, I, I've been having, you know, flashbacks and dreams, but I don't he planted in my head, you know, of her, of me just constantly thinking about it and dreaming about it. You know what I mean? So I don't know what the hell's what, but, um, I remember those repressed memories are real. Yeah. Yeah. And so I remember, um, you know, I, it was right before I had went to prison the first time. I think like I was on an ankle monitor at the time and I was just, um, out on bond and I knew like my sentencing was coming up. I already signed a plea deal with the prosecutor. So I knew like my, my, my seven years was about to come up. So, um, I remember it was, uh, me and my grandma and, um, like my cousin, but he's not really like my blood cousin. He's my, um, how can I explain it? He's like my cousin's cousin. Like, you know, they're related to him. I'm just not related to him. But anyways, I still call him a cousin, whatever. So I remember him asking me, he was like, hey, do you still talk to you two, your two older brothers? And I was like, uh, yeah, you know, sometimes like my other brother was just doing an eight year bid. And then my oldest one, he was somewhere around. And um, I'm like, yeah. And he was like, I don't see how you can even talk to them. I said, why, why wouldn't I? And he was like, man, because they would do some off the wall shit to you every time I would come over every time they would have friends over, they would act like, you know, you were their girlfriend and do things like sexual things to you. And I'm like, man, shut up. And he was like, no, I'm dead serious. So I remember, you know, we had left uh, me and my grandmother and my daughter, we had, we were in her, in the car, in the driveway before we left my aunt's. And I was like, I asked her about it. I said, man, is anything that Trevor is saying true? And she was like, well, I remember you, you know, saying things to me, but you know, we, we would correct them. You know, we would beat their ass and all this stuff. And I was like, so you never did anything? Like, I'm confused. And she's like, well, we did, you know, we kicked them out and all this stuff, which I remember them kicking them out. Um, but I thought 
it was because they wasn't going to school. That's what they told me. But it was so, never reported then. It was never reported. It was just, it was just like just a little sweep under the rug and we will we'll we'll deal with this as they usually yeah. do. <laughs> and what stays in the home, what goes on in the home stays in the home. I've always like I've heard that ever since like that's the first thing I've ever heard, you know, remember, you know, any of my family members, my aunt, my uncles, my grandma, grandpa, they always tell me that. Um, because I had a big mouth and I used to tell people things, you know, and they're like, you can't say that, like shut up. And I'm like, why can't I? Like I thought that was normal, you know? So I thought every family was like that. No, apparently it's not. But um after that day, like I, you know, started having flashbacks. So when I would have these flashbacks of certain things happening of my two older brothers doing to me, I would ask my grandma and she would be like, yeah, you know, that happened, you know, this is what your grandpa did. And I, and I remember one incident, she told me that, um, you know, grandpa came back um, from being on the road. And um, I told him, you know, what your brother did. And he went after, and I remember my grandpa, um, literally they were fist fighting and my oldest brother ended up stabbing him in the hand. So he went to prison for four years. And um, I always thought it was over something else. You know, that's what I was told. And then when I got a little older, she told me, you know, what it was really about. And, um, and it's, it's funny because when, even with my grandma confirming everything, like my aunt and my two uncles and my cousins, like they never believed me when I would tell them like, you know, this happened, like I had, you know, a dream that this happened and I asked grandma and she said it did happen and they thought I was lying. Yeah. So I remember this was before, you know, I had gotten out of prison or before I went to prison the second time. And this was in 2000, the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. And uh, my brother, one of my brothers, the one who did the eight years, he just got out. And um, so I had went to jail and apparently he started having his daughter. She was 16 at the time um, come around and they started having sex, like, you know, sexual relations. And she ended up getting pregnant um, by him. And I'm not too sure if she had an abortion or if she, you know, had a miscarriage. I don't know what happened, but um, I know that her mom reported everything. And uh, so he was just sentenced to 12 to 15 years a couple weeks ago. And I read in the um, news report, uh, news article that, um, they, the prosecutor or the attorneys or whomever, uh, investigators had found his phone and found videos of him drugging his daughter and, um, you know, she would be completely out of it and he would, you know, have sex with her. And then he would have his friends have sex with her. And he was recording this the whole time. And, um, my cousin even mentioned it. When I got out of prison the second time, she, I went to her mom's estate for two weeks, my aunt, and she told me that my brother did the same thing to her. And so apparently like my aunt had the video that, you know, what happened with her and my aunt um, destroyed it. Like she got rid of it. She didn't even report it. She didn't call the police, like nothing like that. Um, you know, and so they never believed me until, you know, obviously recently when, you know, everything was found on his phone and, you know, his daughter and, and mind you, when he was having sex with his daughter, like he, he still like my aunt knew about it and she just, she allowed them to still stay there. Like she was okay with it. I, I'm not too sure how or why she was okay with it, but it was disgusting. So it's there's so many of them. And, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you have probably 12 that you can count just in your home. I'm like, I don't know your, your full story. I mean, I'm hearing it sounds like there's so many people just wanting to sweep and that intergenerational sexual abuse is a mindset. So yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And I remember when I was like my first ever experience with any kind of like sex work or, you know, prostitution or anything was when I was 12 and I met this guy and it's funny now, like, obviously it wasn't funny then, but it's funny now. Um, you know, we just got a computer. We just got the internet and I was on one of them chat room things. Actually, it was called infinite Ohio. That's exactly what it was called. And, um, there was this guy from New York on there. He was like 23, 24. And I was literally 12, but I told him I was 18. I did look older than what I was, but after talking to him for a couple of days, I told him like, look, I'm only 12. I just want to let you know, because he was planning on coming down here to meet me and everything. And he was okay with it. How he, why he was okay with it is another story, but he was okay with it. So we were planning on meeting in the mall and the mall is, uh, it had a, uh, movie theater. So I told my grandma, Hey, I'm meeting a friend from school and we're going to, you know, just catch a movie. So my grandmother was the type to where she, if I was doing something, she's going to know who it's with, where we're at, like the, you know, everything. So she tagged along and there he was just standing there with a bouquet of flowers. And I'm like, oh shit, that's him. Like, I just knew it was freaking him. I never saw a picture of him before, but the way he described himself to me, I just knew it was freaking him. I'm like, oh shit. And he had like a whole like goatee, a beard. I'm like, yeah, he does not look 12 years old. So my grandma's going to flip out. So, and she did, she did. She said, do you know how old she is? She's only 12. And he's like, oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, you did. So yeah. We, she allowed me to go see the movies, you know, to the movies with them, but she was with us. So I was in the middle. She was on my right side. He was on my left. He gets up to go to the bathroom and, um, you know, like five or 10 minutes later, I end up going to, the, I told my grandma I was sick. I didn't feel good. So I needed to go to the bathroom. She followed me, of course. Um, but she stayed outside of the, of the women's bathroom and he was already in the women's bathroom. And I guess he was, you know, he was waiting for me or whatever. So, um, at, you know, this point, like I was still you know, a virgin, you know, and, and like we go into like the handicap stall or the bigger, bigger stall or whatever. And he, um, I still left there. I'm not too sure what I can say or can't say on here, but, um, I still, I left there still a virgin. I'll say that, but he paid me $20. Okay. So after that, I'm like, Oh, okay. So I can do this and get money. I'm yeah. like, okay. So I, I like that idea. And, um, I remember I had to hide it from my grandparents because they were like, how did you get that money? So what I did was I remember gray, gray cards was coming out and I was always good in school. I always got straight A's, maybe a couple B's here and there. So every time I would get like, you know, um, a certain amount of A's, like I would get, you know, I think like $20 each and then B's were, you know, $10. So um, I remember the report cards came out and I got, you know, $60. So I just added that other 20 in there and just acted like, you know, they're not going to and they never noticed. Uh, and so when I turned, obviously, you know, things happened. My grandpa got cancer. We moved to a different city and closer to my aunt. And so, and for some reason, now that I'm thinking, you know, thinking back on everything, I wanted to be like around my aunt so much. I'm not too sure why. I, I don't know if it's because you know, she was like the younger, you know, mom or whatever. And I was always around like, you know, my grandparents and they're old, you know, well, they were old, you know, so it was always fun to be around somebody who is like a young mom, you know, like, cause I never had that. So I always wanted to be around my aunt. So I remember, um, uh, I ended up moving in with her when I turned 13 and she, you know, she telling me, um, I remember her telling me, she sat me down. It was like one evening, um, for some reason she thought I was having sex and I was not having sex then. And, um, it was right before I went to bed and it was just me and her. And she was like, look, you know, um, I just want to let you know that if you, you know, ever decide to have sex, you need to, and if she did tell me, you know, you need to use protection, make sure you're protected and everything. Um, cause you don't want to get pregnant, you know, like I did when, you know, I was in high school and all this stuff and ruin your life. So, and then she turns around and say, says, um, you know, when you turn 16, we're going to go to the strip club because you can make quick money like that. And then she turns around and says, um, something along the lines of, you know, married men are better to, 
you know, interact with because you're able to blackmail them and you're able to get, you know, money from them. Um, so Almost like I, you into prostitution is like, I'm hearing like, is that, is that right? Like, did it, did it sound did she like grooming you into it? Like she was almost I, grooming you into the world. See, I, a lot of people say, say that, but I, I'm not too sure about, I'm not too sure about that. Just because like I, when I, when I turned 14, you know, after I was, you know, raped by my, you know, first crush or whatever the hell you want to call him. Um, that's when I started just, you know, really just spazzing out. And that's when I started, you know, prostituting. Yeah. Um, and so I remember every time that I would go and meet these guys, cause I would meet them off the internet, but she, my aunt never knew, like my family never knew and how I kept it. A, a lot of people was like, how the hell did you keep it from them for so long? Well, it was quite easy when you don't have a, when you have a family that just doesn't care what the hell you do for the most part, you know, families and, and I, people realize this in sexual abuse. Um, secrets are allowed. Like it's not a big deal to have a secret in a upset, like secrets are allowed, like in a healthy family, um, Secrets aren't supposed to be existing, but in, in unhealthy families, there's secrets everywhere and it just doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's easy to hide a secret. I had yeah. drug use for 12 years and to my family. They never knew. You know? Yeah. And that's how, and that's exactly how it was, you know, with my family. Like I said, they, I've always heard the saying, what goes on this house, what it goes, what's uh, what it said in this house and what goes on in this house stays in this house. Like you don't tell your, your business to your friends, to your teachers, nobody. Um, and so my aunt, I remember, um, like my aunt, she would take me, you know, she, sometimes she would take me to school, um, or, you know, I'll just take the bus or whatever. And I remember, um, there was like three different occasions that I, you know, I had an appointment with a client. So I would write a note and I would sign my aunt's name and I would take it to the front office and tell, you know, I, I would pull myself out of like second period or third period or something. And then um, the school never questioned me until my third time. Um, and they ended up calling my aunt. And so what, ha what would happen is once I pulled myself out of that time, that would have been, you know, when the John would come, my client would come and pick me up. And then he would drop me off, you know, right before school was let out. So if my aunt picked me up or I took the bus or whatever it was, I was always there. So the third time that I took that note, um, the secretary called my aunt was like, Hey, I just want to, you know, know what's going on with Ashley. If everything's okay, this is our third, you know, third time being pulled out of school. And my aunt's like, what are you talking about? So I remember my aunt coming to the school and I was gone. Like I was already gone. So she stayed there. I don't know what time she got there, but her ass stayed there until I was dropped off and they saw the cameras because there was cameras all over the freaking school and they saw me getting dropped off. And so, um, the principal was out there waiting for me and my aunt was inside the office inside my gui guidance counselor's office. And, um, he was like, who was, you know, who was that person that dropped you off? And I was like, it's just a friend. Like, you know, we were just hanging out or whatever. At this time I already knew I was busted, whatever. So, um, but I never told my aunt, you know, what I was really doing. I remember I got like three days, three days of out of school suspension, for that. And I also had a week of in-school suspension. So after I did the three day out of school, I had to come back and do, you know, in-school suspension. So that really sucked. Um, but she never once questioned me, never once questioned me. Um, and yeah, and that's, like that's, I, a little, that, that's a suspicious, like it's, it sucks that like it, all the times we get failed, you know? And I mean, you were only a child being picked up by adult men. And like, there was a school involved, there was uh, your aunt involved, there was your family, like, and not one person noticed that, like, and I, I believe that we noticed it, it's, it's, it's fucking insane that not one person noticed it. It's fucking I want, insane. <laughs> I can't. Oh, I don't understand even this. A lot of people will ask me, you know, the same thing, like, how, how did you go all this time, especially like you know, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old. And nobody noticed. When I tell you, nobody noticed. Like I even had a best friend. Um, you know, it was just, I, I never had like any close friends, but her, you know, she was a really good friend at the time. And, um, uh, you know, she, we would hang out all the time, all the time, but 
you know, I would always have her, you know, I never had a job, like a legitimate job, but she worked. So I would, I would always have her spot me money because I never wanted her to find out like, how did you get this money? You don't work, you know, like I could lie and say, yeah, my aunt, grandma, there's a few times where I did, you know, say that. Um, but you know, every time she would drop me off, there's a lot of times where she would drop me off. Like literally, um, we would go meet, I had like an appointment with a client or whatever, and we would go meet this client, but she thought that it was just somebody that I was just talking to, you know, just randomly talking to on the internet. And she, you know, I was just meeting them for the first time. Um, so she would, you know, tag along and I would stay there. I'm like, Oh, you know, I'm just going to stay here and chill. You know, they'll just take, he'll just take me back. And she's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's fine. So, you know, she would leave, but she never even had a clue what I was doing. I was like, that's literally like my client, like that's happened more than a dozen times. Um, and she never had a clue. Like, wow. That, yeah. I mean, it was just, and I mean, I, clients become regulars too, right? Is that like, a, that's like, I've never worked in the sex industry. Um, I'm, I'm grateful and lucky that I never, I, my game was so different when I was addicted. I ended up, um, you know, my husband was a dealer and like, that's how I got my drugs. I never had to worry about that. I never really got addicted to that, uh, that part of it, like the sex with the, like the validation through men that way. I got it through my husband on which, I mean, I think I'm grateful for, but in a sense, you know, I'm the addiction was awful, but, um, yeah. So I, I sharing that was interesting to me. Sorry. Keep going. <laughs> you're fine, you're fine. Yeah. Like I, you know, that that's, that's exactly, you know, the reason why I started doing any of this was because I wasn't, you know, I would always hear my aunt and cousins and, you know, every time my cousin's friends would come over, they all would always talk, you know, crap about me. Um, you know, would just call me names and like, I mean, it was like a, a constant thing. Yeah. Um, literally like, and I, I truly believe that I started it, you know, started doing that, you know, lifestyle because these men would literally, they wanted my attention. You know what I mean? Like these, my family didn't want my attention. They, they, men were paying what they liked, attention. yeah. So what they like, what my family likes seeing is me failing. Like every time I would get in trouble, um, you know, with a school or, you know, just trouble in general, like my aunt would start paying attention to me. But when I would, um, you know, start when I was doing good and get, you know, getting good grades and doing this, this, and this, like she, she just didn't care. Like she would always, you know, compare me to my cousin, to her daughter, um, and when I got pregnant with my son, you know, when I found out I was pregnant, I was like seven months and, you know, she was all excited that I was pregnant and, you know, I didn't want to be pregnant. I didn't want to have a kid. I, I didn't want none of, you know, nothing. When you got pregnant with your first baby, right? If I read that correctly, were you just, were, were you only 14 when you got pregnant with your first? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So that particular situation was, you know, his dad, I met him, you know, um, on my 14th birthday and, you know, he came over a couple weeks later and the first time he came over, he raped me. Like even till this day, you know, I made a YouTube video about it and his wife that he's married to, cause he's doing a 10 year bid, uh, for doing the same thing he did to me with little girls, like 10 year, 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old. Wow. So, um, his wife literally had the audacity to leave a couple comments on my YouTube video of my life story, talking about, you know, my situation with my son and with, you know, him, um, she said, um, well, this is coming from the words of Paul Schuler. And the only reason why I'm saying his name is because he's a pedo. And I will always, you know, I would never hide his name. And, um, so she was like, you know, he's saying that this never happened. He doesn't remember it happening like this and everything. Yeah, of course, he's not going to remember it happening like this um, because he doesn't want to face the fact that, you know, his son is a product of what the hell he did to me. So after I had my son, um, my aunt, even after that incident, like I told my aunt immediately after it happened, um, she, she didn't do anything about it. And I still talk to him even after he did that to me. Um, for some reason, I thought, 
you know, at first, like, oh, maybe this is what guys do when they like somebody because, you know, my brothers did it yep. and, you know, this is like my first crush and he's doing it. So maybe it is like a normal thing for guys. Yeah. Uh, so I just, you know, kept talking to him. He would come over and then we, I had ran away with him. I remember my aunt and uncle went out for, you know, their anniversary dinner or something. He came over, he had four trash bags. He was like, okay, well, you know, talk to your cousins, keep them occupied while I go upstairs to your room and pack your, pack your clothes. So that's what he did. Put all my clothes in trash bags. He put them in his truck, get a pickup truck, a red pickup truck. And, um, I told my cousin, I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to go down the street to the gas station. You know, I'll be right back. And she's like, well, you know, make sure, you know, you're back before mom comes back. I'm like, yeah, I will. So we left, we went to a hotel and I remember, um, his mom calling him and his mom was like, I, she, she was yelling and she's like, Paul, do you understand that she's only 14 years old? What the hell are you doing with her? And at the time he was 19 or 20. And so he was like, oh, and, and I remember him saying, oh, well, you know, uh, she's getting abused by her, by her family, by her aunt and uncle, which is it, like physical abuse now. So, uh, but I never corrected him or anything. Cause I was just like, oh, I don't give a shit, whatever. So um, the next day we ended up stop. We left the hotel. We stopped at like Lowe's or something. I don't know. He, he went in and then we started um, hitting the road and we were right by like the borderline of like West Virginia and Ohio. And we get stopped by that, um, highway patrol officer and he went to jail and my aunt came to pick me up and she was pissed. And I told her, you know, you know what he did to me, you know, like it was consensual the second time we had sex, but the first time, no. Well, so was, I'm just uh, like, was he much older than you? He was night. He was either 19 or 20. I can't yeah. remember her. Wow. I think maybe 19, but, um, wow. you know, I, she ended up taking me to children's right when she picked me up. Um, and she told, yeah, to get a rape test done and everything like that. And I told, I told them, no, I don't want it done because like that particular incident was consensual. Like, mm-hmm. why are you going to have it done? So you know, at this point I was kind of protecting him just because, you know, I still liked him and everything. Um, so he ended up doing, like, I remember the detectives coming over and then I found out I was pregnant. Maybe like, like I said, uh, maybe four or five months later. And I was, you know, almost seven months along. And, um, I remember the detective coming over and him asking me like a bunch of questions and I told him everything. So they charged him with delinquency, uh, con- I-, I forget something with the delinquency of a minor and he got like four or four and a half years or something. Yeah. So while he was in prison, obviously like I had my son and I was just having issues with, you know, raising him, taking care of him just because I, I honestly to tell you the truth. I just didn't want to, I felt like I was forced to be a mom and that just wasn't fair to me and it wasn't fair to him. You know, um, so my aunt, after, immediately after I had my son, I gained like a lot of weight, you know, for the, you know, during the pregnancy. So I had like five, five or six weeks until I went back to school and I wanted to get the weight off while she was giving me these diet pills. And I thought they were diet pills. Okay. So I remember going to, and I lost a lot of weight. I did lose a lot of weight. Um, but I also was very active too. Like I was in kickboxing and doing jazzercise and stuff like that. So, um, I didn't really think anything of it. And, uh, there was a few times where I took it, where I, what I did get sick, but I just thought, oh, it's just a diet pill. So I remember going to a temp service because my aunt's like, okay, well, you need to get a job now that, you know, you have a kid and everything. So I was trying to do things the right way, get a job, you know, not have to, you know, prostitute anymore and just do the right thing, go to school and all this stuff. Well, I remember going to the temp service. It was called uh, Blake Temp Service or some some crap. And um, so they drug tested me and it came back positive for amphetamines. And I was like, what the hell is that? Wow. And she was like, she, she called me up to the thing. She was like, Hey, come here for a second. And she did tell me, she was like, Hey, I just want to let you know it came back positive. I'm going to, I'm going to say that it's negative you know, but if you have a problem, you need to get help. I was like, help with what? My aunt was standing right there. 
Oh, and my aunt was like, oh, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing, you know? And I'm thinking to myself, like, what the hell is she talking about? I remember um, my other aunt, like, she's not really my aunt, but she, you know, married into the family. She married my uncle, but they were divorced or whatever. They're yeah. still divorced. Anyway, so I remember her telling me that my aunt had went to her one day, and this was around the time that I got drug tested and stuff, and I was taking these diet, diet pills, um, that she would have her go get her, you know, some Coke and some crack and stuff. And she said that I was the one that was taking this stuff. And I'm like, I was not taking it. Like, what the hell? I was not addicted to any of that shit. Well, come to find out she was feeding it to me, you know, in these little capsules and stuff. Oh my God. Oh. Yeah. So what she did was, um, at the time, cause I, I was smoking weed and I was, you know, drinking, um, but she was also feeding me these pills and she called children's services on me because she thought that by her doing so that, you know, my kid would be taken, she would have custody of my kid. Um, and it backfired on her because when children's services came in the home, um, like they did a background check on everybody and they found out that my uncle had her husband at the time had like domestic violence against her, her son, her youngest son or younger son. And, um, so they said, you know, this is not a suitable household for a baby. So they, you know, took him out of the household and, um, you know, I, I knew right then and there that like, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't take care of him. I just couldn't take care of him. So I made the mistake of allowing his grandmother, my son's grandmother, which is the guy that raped me, his mom, yep. you know, take care of him. I yep. signed my right to her and everything. So well, it sounds like too, um, the guy who raped you, his, he, he, he was like, almost like your savior. If, if I'm getting that right, like you felt like you didn't belong in a family. And then, you know, when you met him, he gave you that, like, I'm going to take you away. And like, life is going to be fucking awesome. But yes. like, yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So I can see how you would, you know, grab it. And, and, and coming from a family of dysfunction, you, you really can't see dysfunction in other families. So you really, you're like, oh shit, they seem totally fine. Like they're normal. Yes. <laughs> but yes. I'm sure you got a story. Exactly. exactly. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. And I really thought, you know, um, like my, my one friend, that well, only one friend that I had, and she, her family was the complete opposite. So I was, I was literally looking at her family. Like there's something wrong with these motherfuckers. Like I, there's something really wrong because, you know, they're not, they never yell at each other and, you know, they're not doing any drugs. They're not having no fun. Like they're pretending. That's what I always thought. I'm like, they're fucking fake. That bitch is fake. Like, no, she's just happy. Yes, yes. No, that's what a normal family consists of. You know, like I, it's crazy looking back on everything. And I remember that, that friend, me and her, we're not friends anymore, but because her baby dad tried to sleep with me and all, it was just a whole mess. And I told on her, told on him and she believed him or me, whatever, I don't give a shit. But anyways, long story short, I remember back in 2016, she messaged me on Facebook and she was like, you know, um, I tried to get you away from, you know, that family. And I try to have you and Cameron, you know, my son, um, you know, come stay with me so you can get on the right path and all that, which she did. I remember, you know, her and her, you know, mom did that, but I think I was just so like addicted to the chaos, to the drama, to just the toxicity that I, I didn't want that normalcy. I wanted to be in the toxic environment just because I was so used to it. And I thought that was normal and there was something wrong with them. So yes. You know, I'm like, why, why do you guys care so much about me staying here? Like, there's something wrong with you guys. Like you guys are fucking weird. So that's why I went back to that family. But, I, you know, I remember her telling me that. And, you know, I kept thinking to myself, like, man, what if I did do that? Like, maybe my life would have been completely different, you yeah. know, than what it is. Well, what it was, you know, then now my life is pretty good, but you know, back then it was, man. I think we're all on the path um, for a reason. And I mean, like seeing you share your story on TikTok, like it, it is speaking volumes to women. 
like you and it shows like it's like i'm here today because i like when you came across my for you page and you're like the long-term effects of prostitution and like you know you were saying the long-term effects i had of sexual abuse and like that was like i could have been i'm not saying that your life was worse than mine or my life was worse than yours but your your path could have been my path and that you know makes me want to fight harder you know and it's just and my path could have been your path and that i hope makes somebody else want to fight harder you know and i just sharing your story is just so impactful like it's just it's impactful and that's why i think we are set on a journey so like regardless of what you've done and what mistakes you've made i think they're all for a reason <laughs> personally yeah i think so too i think so too and that's why i when I first got on, you know, TikTok, I was seeing a lot of young girls glamorizing that lifestyle. And, you know, at first I'm like, okay, you know, that's, that's cool or whatever. But then I'm thinking like, nah, this is not how it is. You know, this is like the reality of it. It's not all peaches and cream. And you just all of a sudden get a, a shit ton of money all the time. Like that's not the case. Like other things happen to you. You know, like I'm even till this day, like I left that life alone at the beginning. I got sober at the end of 2018. Um, you know, I had a little bump, you know, hurdles and everything in between in between time. But, um, you know, I left that life, you know, the prostitution life and everything alone at the beginning of 2019. And um, I, even till this day, I still have like I, you know, a, a lot of stuff because of being, you know, in that lifestyle for so long, for 20 years, like I'm still reaping the, you know, the um, aftermath of it. Like I still have, you know, a lot of, like, I can't even go anywhere by myself. Like I literally have to have my wife go with me or my daughter go with me. Um, and my anxiety is just so bad. The PTSD, the night terrors, like, I mean, these are like real things. And a couple of people, when I did that video that you're talking about, I've had so many people reach out to me and they're like, um, a few of them was like, oh, you know, you're just exaggerating everything. No, like I'm serious. Like I would literally wake up in the middle of the night screaming. Um, I didn't even know I was screaming. I would wake myself up screaming, you know, like these are, this is real life. This is what being in life does for you. Mm -hmm hard and I, that's something like i struggle with too so bad and like when you say you're waking up like i i wake up in the night sweating shaking like my kids can't even walk into the room um like if my kids walk into my bedroom i literally i can't even handle it. i jump so high i i get like it scares me for somebody to walk in my room so i mean you're like I, when i seen you on my for you page i was like this girl is real this girl's telling her story and i just love her and it was so exciting like you were sharing so many great details of your life too you know like just sharing the fact that your brothers assaulted you i mean it's so hard for us to share that that deep stuff that our family's done to us and you know and i mean something else i seen on your tiktok that i wanted to ask you about too is that your family reached out to you now yeah. that they've seen your success because you're you're killing it on there and you know it's clear that you're going places so, uh, <laughs> it is like it's totally clear so what happened with that? I kind of wanted to like get the dirt. <laughs> oh, and so, uh, you know, after, you know, I blew up or whatever you want to call it, you know, it's still kind of all surreal and just kind of funny to me when people react, when they see me and stuff, it's just funny to me. But anyways, um, this was in June and I remember in, you know, July and August when I would, you know, go live. Cause I, you know, would go live all the time. I don't go live so much now. It's just a lot of, different things are going on now. But um, I remember my cousin, uh, he had moved away to like Arkansas, I think, Arkansas. So he was the only one in the family that did something with his life, right? Uh, he never a drug addict, never had a problem with drugs or drinking, never went to jail, you know, that kind of guy, you know, he works at, he's a surgeon tech and, you know, he, he's a good, he's a good kid. Um, so, you know, he moved away, but he still, you know, talks to his mom, you know, obviously, and, you know, everybody else, but me. So I don't talk to anybody in that family at all. So I remember when I was in my life, um, I saw his name, you know, and he was like, Hey, you know, what's going on cousin. And I looked. And so I was like, uh, maybe it's somebody else with that same name. Right. So, um, he said it again and I was like, Oh, okay. So, you know, it was kind of like I was emotional at the time 
during that, during that live, just because like, oh, you know, my cousin's reaching out to me. I haven't talked and I haven't talked to him for before then. I think it was like 10, 10, 12 years. Um, he's younger than me. So, uh, you know, he, he, he was trying to like slither his way on, you know, into my life just because, you know, before, before I blew up, he never tried to get in contact with me, but I remember him saying in that live, oh, well, I've been trying to contact you. I've been trying to message you. And I'm like, where'd you message me at? And he's like on here. So I gave him the benefit of a doubt. Right. So I remember I was on live on my phone and I had my laptop right here. So I got on Facebook and I'm like, okay, I'm about to send you a message now and give you my number. So that's what I did. Now, after I got off live, I went to his page and I clicked the message. You know, I'm like, okay, well, what did he say to me? And there, nothing. He didn't try messaging me. So I'm like, okay. So I knew what, what was what. So, um, you know, after that, like I, you know, did a couple of videos after that, just because um, I, I, I don't like when, okay, you, you see that I'm doing good or doing good or, you know, better, I guess you can say I'm doing better. And I'm getting a lot of, you know, attention from around the world and everything. Like now all of a sudden, you know, you want to reap my benefits, you know, and you think that you're going to come back into my life and you're, you know, people's going to know who you are and stuff like that. So no. Um, and so I did a couple of videos and I said, you know, um, if any of my family members feel like they're about to come back into my life, that's not going to happen. Like you guys weren't there. I remember, I literally remember and that, that he wasn't the only member that, you know, done, done that. My cousin did it. My other cousin. Um, it's so impactful I'm, in my life because um, for me, like, you know, you see the, the, the repercussions that I'm getting on TikTok as well with my family reaching out, screaming and yelling and bashing me. And, and, and when you said like, I'm not going to take this shit, you know, on your TikTok, I don't know exactly how the words were, yeah. were created, but I remember it was like, you know, you're like, I'm not fucking dealing with this. Um, yeah. and I was like, me neither. Like, <laughs> I had to keep that, I had to keep that mindset. And I, I remember, um, you know, my, I have two girl cousins. Okay. And I remember, um, my daughter, when I went to prison the second time, my oldest daughter was with, uh, my, one of my girl cousins that I thought she would be good with because she didn't do drugs. She didn't nothing like that. So I thought, okay, you know, she had three kids of her own, but you know, I think my daughter will be okay with her, be safe with her. No, absolutely not. It was the complete opposite. I remember my daughter telling me that they used to fist fight all the time that, you know, she would, my cousin would tell her that I was just this piece of shit mom, that I was never going to amount to anything. I was never going to get my life together. I'm never going to get her back. And my daughter would stick up for me. So um, I remember and doing a couple videos, you know, obviously, you know, talking about that or whatever, but then she ended up sending me a friend request, you know, on Facebook and ended up trying to, um, uh, message me on Facebook. I still got the message request on there. I still didn't accept it, you know, and I, and then let me say this. And then my second cousin, my second girl cousin, she did the same thing. She told her, my daughter would fist fight all the time. Um, and she would, you know, say the same thing. Your mom's nothing but a piece of shit junkie. She's nothing but a hoe. She's this, 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 and this. Okay. Um, and then I remember like, and I remember telling, telling my daughter, I was on the phone with her. I was in the um, workhouse and that's what we call the county jail for, you know, that's where the girls are housed at here. So it was right before I rode out to prison. I told her, I'm like, look, Nessa, you know, everything happens for a reason. And, you know, the universe will end up you know, coming back around to them. Don't, don't worry about that. Like I am going to eventually get my shit together. Like this is not going to be my lifelong freaking, you know, journey. Like just, just give me some time. Like I got to do this time. You know, there's no way around that. Um, you know, and I remember like after I had gone out, you know, and ended up getting, um, you know, clean and sober and all this stuff and started doing the next, you know, best thing or the right thing in life or whatever. Um, then my, both of my cousins, they got all their kids taken away from them. And, um, one of my cousin, she ended up going to jail. She ended up going to prison for a year. Um, and these were the exact same things that they were telling my daughter that was going to happen to me. Oh, your mom's just going to, you know, keep going back to prison. Your mom is not going to get any of you kids back, you know, and then they end up 
you know, yeah. doing it what they said I was going to do. So, you know, that's why I tell all of my kids, you need to be careful on what you say and how you treat people because it's come back around to you. No, karma comes back around. My my family always like they. Uh, my family doesn't struggle with substance abuse, but they struggle with intergenerational sexual abuse. And they they um, they judge every drug addict out there. They call them pieces of shit, losers, trash, the worst things in the world. But guess what? They create so many fucking drug addicts from what they're doing, and it's just like it's just heartbreaking. Like you got to watch what you say because their own children are turning into their their hate you know and and it's like heartbreaking to like you got to really be careful because karma is a bitch you know and it does smack you in the face oh Oh, yeah and I like no way sorry sorry. (laughs) and way shape or form am I like saying ha ha you know they got their kids taken and this and that's happening to them I'm not making a joke of that because that's not anything you know to make fun of that is really heartbreaking. But what I am, you know, enjoying is, you know, them living the life that they said they would never live because they're so much better than me. And, yeah. you know, it just slapped them in the face. That's what I like. That's oh, what I like. I hear so. you. Like a slap in the face sometimes. Like, you know what? It's not as easy as it looked. Like, you know, you you maybe had it together when I didn't, but sometimes yeah. it, you do fall apart. Um, so a, a question I wanted to ask you um, is if, if I... I'm, I have a lot of teens listening to you. I, I run a group for uh, sexual abuse survivors and they are like obsessed with you and they talk about you and they're so excited for this. So um, any advice for teens who are thinking about getting into the game and any advice for people wanting to get out of the game is what I'm, uh, what I was kind of, yeah. Okay. So advice for young girls or, you know, guys that are wanting to get into the game. Yeah. Uh, don't do it. Don't yes. do it. You know, <laughs> It's not all, and let me say this. I, I think, is it reliving your trauma? Do you feel like you're reliving your trauma all the time? Like when you were being, when you were, when you were uh, uh, prostituting, did it feel like the abuse just regularly? It's kind of curious. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, I, I, I got so accustomed to it that I, that it was just like a normalcy to me. Yeah. So I, it was just normal for me when I ended up getting into like relationships that, um, or, you know, talk to somebody or had a friendship or any kind of relation with that didn't treat me bad. Like I, I was triggered by that. I, I don't know how to explain it. It, it was, it was really crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, I know that you're explaining it well. Yeah. And, you know, if I, Obviously, like if I could do it all over again, I definitely would have taken a different path. Um, a lot of girls, and that's what is wrong with social media, because there are a lot of girls um, that are glamorizing this lifestyle. And, and let me say this, my lifestyle that I personally lived and the lifestyle that these girls are glamorizing are different, but they're similar too. you know, like what I mean by different is they're not walking the street. Yeah, glamorizing that OnlyFans, I hear it. Like I hear it. It's glamorizing, glamorizing, yeah. glamorizing. And and it can't be that great. I I it can't be. Like it it can't be. I no. mean, these are I remember, I remember doing a video and, and it wasn't like, you know, I was trying to compare, you know, compare like my lifestyle to what like what they what they do. But you know, I did make that make a, a statement like uh, what I did, nobody would have known what I did had I never talked about it. But if you guys upload pictures and upload videos of you doing certain things, it's going to be on the internet for the rest of your life. Like anybody, anybody can, you know, take that video or take those pictures and upload it to like any website, to Facebook, to Instagram, to wherever. And there's nothing you can do about it, you know? And I remember when I made that video, I got so much hate for it. Like, oh, you're, you're, you're thinking you're better than people who do OnlyFans. No, I'm not. I'm just stating the facts. The facts is that, you know, nobody would have known what I've done if I never talked about it, but cause there's no evidence, but there's evidence when you do OnlyFans or do, you know, stuff like that, because it's always, it's always on there always going to re-victimize you you know when you do want to get out of the game and you're done with it that's going to be haunting you behind you like you know that's going to be living in your back forever and I and you're you're getting out of the game and I don't know if you have any you know 
things online, but um, it sounds like, you know, you're able to just put your past behind you, but that's always going to throw up in their face, you know, and that's scary. Um, it's yeah. not something that I would want to glamorize either. So I, I totally agree with you on like not glamorizing only fans. Yeah. I like, you know, I think, and I think we all seen it on TikTok coming along and saying like, and it was almost like, oh my God, this is going to be awesome. Like, I'm going to start one because I'm going to make all this money. Like, you know, it's not going to be good for you. <laughs> and it's, it's not like the, the girls who are saying that they're making a lot of money, they, they didn't start, start out making a lot of money. Like you have to like, literally it is a process, a long process, you know, like, and, and, and let me just say this, not all money is good money. And, uh, even though like, I, I know like a few of these girls, like I see them do, well, I never saw them, but I, you know, the TikTok, you know, videos and stuff, I see them doing collab people, you know, they say, oh, well it, I do collabs with people that I know, or, you know, whatever, well, you don't know what that person is capable of doing. Like you can get a guy who, you know, you think that, you know, and he comes over and he does like the unthinkable to you, like things like that happen, you know? Um, and he's going to think that it's okay just because you guys are doing the only thing it's a, a video, you know, for it. And um, yeah, there's so many little deep holes inside of the only like, oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you just opened my eyes up to that because that's something that I never even thought about was all the little things behind the scenes. And my mind is I, only on the pictures, <laughs> not on the rest of it. And that's where, you know, you're awesome because you've worked in that industry. So you know that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how, you know, and that's like even all parts of the industry, you know, like porn or anything like you porn. And I'll say this porn is a lot safer than anything else just because you get tested regularly and all that stuff so you know you got that down packed but you still just never know like the director or anything like he could be a creep and, and just a complete pig and he made the industry yeah yeah and it's you know i i try like my obviously like my my oldest daughter she knows you know, she knows everything, yeah. but my babies, they don't know anything. They don't know that I have social media. They don't know anything like that. Yeah. But eventually when they're old enough to understand, like, I want to tell, you know, all of my kids, um, you know, like this is what happened and this is a lifestyle that I don't want you living. And I will do whatever I have to do to make sure you don't have to live that lifestyle. Like the reason why I chose that lifestyle, it wasn't like, you know, I had a pimp or somebody else that came in and just took me under their wing. I chose to live this lifestyle because I wasn't getting love at home. I wasn't getting attention. I, you know, I, they just didn't care, you know? So I want to make sure that I'm doing the complete opposite with my kids so that they, they know that they don't ever have to turn to, you know, two guys or two, to, to you know, it. we're, me and you, we're going to validate our children. We're going to tell our children that life is good. Like, you know, we're going to give our children the validation they need, you know, because um, we know how important it is now. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm getting a lot of validation on TikTok. I feel really strong and powerful and proud. And I think, you know, coming from a survivor to survivor, I think you can understand that too. You know, you're like, yeah, like people yes. stand by me and I'm proud. And I wanted to ask you too, uh, what is the future looking like for you? So I seen that you're teaming up with like a safe house or something, or I'm not sure. So I, I I'm not hundred percent. So you tell me. <laughs> so, um, I, okay. I've been trying for almost a year to get certified to be a PRS just so I can, you know, PRS here in Ohio is a peer recovery supporter. Right. Okay. So, um, try to just help, you know, working girls or girls that are, you know, getting out of the lifestyle, trying to get out, they're struggling or whatever, just women in general. Um, that's just trying to, you know, get their life together. And here in Ohio, you have to be certified for that. And in order to get certified, you can't have certain charges on your record because that automatically disqualifies you. So um, one of my supporters ended up getting me in contact with this lady. She has a, a safe house, a nonprofit um, on the west side of Columbus. And literally when this lady told me, I was on the phone with this lady for an hour and she said she wanted to meet up with me, you know, and because I told her like what my plans were, I told her I want to, since I can't, because um, initially how I got in contact with her was she had two positions open for her nonprofit that she was hiring for. 
And so the girl, my supporter was like, oh, I think you'll be great for this and everything. So I went ahead and messaged her. I knew that I had to be certified, but I just went ahead and messaged her anyway. She's like, yeah, you have to be certified. This is what I'm hiring for, you know, all this stuff. So I'm like, oh, okay, great. Well, you know, closed mouths don't get fed. So I went ahead and told her everything. I'm trying to get certified. I can't because of my charges. I can't get them expunged because I have multiple of the same charge. It's just a whole bunch of mess. So um, she was like, oh, and I told her like, my goal is if I can't get certified, then I want to, I'm going to open up my own nonprofit. I want to do a safe house. I want to help these girls, you know, get their life together. Um, and she was like, well, I have my own nonprofit. Why don't we just partner up rather than, you know, doing it? you know, separately. And I was all for, I was all for it. So we talked on the phone and all this stuff, but then she tells me where her safe house is at. And it's literally right next door to the trap house where I used to be at. And I'm like, oh, like, I I just don't understand like why you would have a safe house, right? Where the sex trafficking is so bad. Like, I agree. I agree. You need to take the, you need to take the addict out of the atmosphere and like, you know, and if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're in sex work, it's an addiction too, right? Like it's a huge addiction. So you got to take the addict right out of the atmosphere and that's, that's putting it right in it. <laughs> yeah. That's what I, you know, I, I said something to somebody else, like, oh, I think like one of my lives that are like, well, a lot of like the good neighborhoods, like the suburban neighborhoods, whatever, just don't like, you know, those kind of people, you know, that's why they have the safe houses and the rehabs and the halfway houses in the hood, which that's how it is here. I don't know how it is everywhere else, but here in Columbus, the halfway houses, the rehabs, the sober living, the safe house for, you know, working girls are literally right in the hood. And, um, you know, I was, and I started a Facebook support group, you know, it's, it's a private group. I can't share the name of it or anything, but, um, it's for girls who are, you know, in the sex working industry or, you know, had, you know, endured any kind of like trauma or abuse or anything like that. It's like a safe, safe place, like a safe haven for them. Yeah. Um, and I eventually want to do in-person weekly meetings here in Columbus. And um, the woman, the lady that I spoke with, you know, that has her own, on, uh, her own nonprofit, she said that I'm more than welcome to use her place for the weekly meetings. So I told her, I'm like, oh, okay, you know, and I agreed before she told me where it was at. Then she told me right before we hung up where she's located at. I'm like, oh my God, like what the hell? So um, I'm still going to look, I'm so, I'm so going to keep an open mind. She hasn't contacted me yet, but I'm going to contact her back and be like, hey, what's going on? What's up? But um, I'm going to check it out. And, you know, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I am all for, you know, I told her, even if I don't get certified, she, she put me in contact with a prosecutor who oversees expungements, who oversees sealments and everything. And, um, I went downtown last week to, you know, start the process, but they were closed and because they're understaffed and it's just, it seems like every time I try to get ahead, I'm like 10 feet back, like it, it, 10 steps back. It's so crazy. And, but I'm still going to keep pushing forward. Either I get my record sealed or expunged so that I can get certified and I can help these girls or bottom line, I'm going to start my own nonprofit and, but it's not going to be in the hood. It's going to be in a nice freaking area where you take these girls out of that lifestyle because they're never going to change if they're still in that, you know, same area. They're just not, it's not going to, it's not going to happen. I mean, that's a great place to have, you know, a safe place for them to go to, you know, that they don't have nowhere else to go and get it. But Rehabilitation in it. You know, you want to rehabilitate these girls, not just to help them in the moment. And I like helping them in the moment is so important as well, right? We need that in life as well. But um, right. there is, you know, there's that piece that you want to help. You want these girls to heal. <laughs> like you want them to feel. I want them to do better. I want them to be better, you know, because they they deserve better. And I'm all for harm reduction. I'm all for, you know, I'm all for that. But, you know, that's only short term, long term goals, you know, long term, you know, stability for getting your shit together. You got to, you got to be in a better and a better environment. And that's just not it. So, you know, I'm going to contact her today and see what, you know, see what's what, but, you know, for a long term, that's not, I, you know, as far as like partnering up with her, maybe, maybe if she agrees to have it like in a better neighborhood, but you know, if not, that's totally fine. I'll just do my own thing. 
things coming for you. I really do. I mean, anybody who's going to team up with you is smart because you know it so well, you know, the game and you're like, and honestly, I'm going to listen to somebody like myself. Okay. Like I'm a survivor. I'm going to listen to you over the therapist. Like I love therapists. Don't get me wrong. I go to one and I love them to death because they're awesome. But um, when I'm, a, when I'm young, when I'm thinking about myself, when I'm young, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to listen. I'm not going to listen to the therapist. I'm going to listen to the girl who's done it, you know, yeah. and that's why you're so important to the safe houses. And, and I think that I see nothing but great things for your future, Ashley. I'm so excited. Thanks for coming on my podcast today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. Like I'm um, really, really, I was really looking forward to it. Oh, thank you. you know, this, this this was a dream come true for me, and you're you're keeping me sober today, and I'm so happy to have heard your story because I'll I'll stay sober today, and that's awesome. Thank I you know, so much. You girl, are you welcome, babe? Bye. <laughs>